I'll add my voice to the chorus of welcomes you've no doubt received since you walked through the building today, through the door of the building. Uh, next week, somehow, it's already Advent. Uh, so November is quickly winding down and December is on its way. And the beginning of Advent means that today is the last Sunday of the traditional church calendar. In some congregations, they call today something special. Uh, they call it Christ the King Sunday. Christ the King Sunday. And on this Sunday, we focus on, linger a bit, on the idea of Jesus as King. Christ has many identifiers, many names, some of which uh, we are quite familiar with. Things like Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Those names of Christ we'll be talking through, working through, meditating on in our sermon series during Advent and also in a life group opportunity which will follow the service on those Advent Sundays. And of course, this all leads up to thinking of Christ as baby, Christ as newborn, Christ as vulnerable coming into the world, God taking on human flesh and walking among us. But today we think about Christ in our lives as the king of our lives, Christ as one who will come again as king. In a world in a life that can feel chaotic and out of control, Christ the King Sunday uplifts the kingdom of heaven, breaking forth among us now and the kingdom that is coming, but not quite yet. It's a relatively new Christian celebration, really the, around 1920s is when it began. And so most often the day is celebrated with a few key scripture readings above all else, one of which we'll read today, uh, Matthew 25. And to set that passage up a bit, we find that in the chapters leading up to Matthew 25, Jesus is predicting the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. He's fielding questions about the end of the age. And through several parables, including a parable about a fig tree and ser several parables that we group together called the parables of watchfulness, Jesus encourages his followers to be ready and to do right with consistency and with urgency. In one of those parables that immediately precedes our passage for today, called the parable of the talents, there's a master who entrusts varying amounts of money, talents, to his servants before he goes away. He expects that when he returns that there will be something else there, more than was there in the beginning. And so two of the servants invest and increase their talents, while one decides to bury his. I don't want to lose it, I'm just going to keep it there. But upon the master's return, he applauds the ones who had invested it, who had grown it, and he condemns the one who took inaction. He didn't necessarily do anything harmful, but he didn't do anything that would be helpful. And so soon as we approach the season of Advent, which in part emphasizes the return of Christ the King, we reflect on our passage for today and we're reminded that Jesus has entrusted us with something far more valuable than talents or finances. Jesus has entrusted us with one another, with our neighbors. So with this in mind, let's encounter our passage for today. It's unique in the New Testament as the only description of the last judgment. So here's how Jesus describes it. So you can follow along in your pew Bibles, your Bible at home, or on the screen. The reading comes from Matthew, again, chapter 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? 
or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you, a stranger, and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you in sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. And so we say, thanks be to God. Now, to better understand this passage, it's always helpful to get a bit of context, uh, some of which we've already covered, right? What precedes this passage? How can that help us to interpret what it means? I'll give you a few other contextual things that might help us, that helped me. The passage, according to Professor Thomas Stegman, draws on the passage from Daniel chapter 7 in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. This is an apocalyptic and prophetic passage in which Daniel was describing this vision of God being enthroned in glory and bestowing on the Son of Man dominion and glory to set forth the full manifestation of God's reign. In other words, what I mean by this and what I think this means is that this visionary passage from Daniel is often interpreted as a depiction of God's ultimate triumph over oppression, over worldly powers, and in place of that, an establishment of a new kingdom. In more other words, whatever yearning that you have for things that don't feel quite right, things that you know are not right, there's hope in the Hebrew Bible, and that Jesus is aiming to fulfill, and that Jesus does fulfill, that all will be made right. That the kingdom of heaven, again, is breaking forth among us. We get glimpses now. We'll know more later. Jesus, the Messiah, is establishing a new kingdom, Christ, our King. We can also think about, uh, as Leah uh, demonstrated, what about these sheep and goats? And what were they thinking? What were the original readers and hearers of this word thinking about sheeps, sheep and goats? Well, at night, shepherds separated the sheep from the goats, typically, those who had both. And the sheep enjoyed the open air of the pasture, but goats had to be protected from the cold. Because sheep at the time had more commercial value, they were preferred over goats. As a shepherd, which was a common comparison that we know Jesus is afforded, Jesus, the good shepherd, now appearing as the son of man, the glorious son of man, is separating sheep and goats. So this is an image for them that would be really quick, right? That would not require that additional contextual consideration. But for us, depending on your experience with sheep and goats, might. Now, Matthew uses this distinction between sheep and goats here, but in other places, he does something similar. He draws a distinction in terms of what we're doing as faithful people in the world. He makes comparisons from wheat and tares, from wise maidens and foolish ones, and so on. And through these distinctions, the gospel writer Matthew is making the case that a life of faith requires of us a sense that we can start to bring about justice, but that in the end, justice does not belong to us. There's something beyond us that is the final arbiter of justice. At the same time, Matthew makes the case in passages like the one for today that faith is less of something that you have and more of something that you do. Now, there's a lot more context to offer here. If you're interested, let's talk after. But I think that should suffice for now. We've read the passage. We've added some context to it. And now we have to answer the question, what in the world do we do with it? How do we respond to God's word in our lives? And so one way that we can interpret this passage, that we can understand it, is by thinking of it as a bit of a, a wellness check, 
Um, there was a pastor named Lindsey Armstrong that thought of this idea of this wellness check. And uh, I like that a lot in understanding this passage. It's a bit of a diagnostic tool. When you go to the doctor, they may take different measurements, they may use different tools to discern, you know, what's going on with you? What's your medical history? Are there any sheep or goats in the family? Like that kind of thing, right? And so when I go to the doctor, uh, I have a history in my family of, of heart problems. And so they're going to know that, right? I'm going to report that to them if I have that knowledge, and not everybody does. But if I have that knowledge, I can share that with them. And then they can decide, okay, uh, well, we'll definitely look at this number. We need to pay attention to this. And that could, right, make me afraid. I could feel fear because of that. I see that tool, that diagnostic test, they're doing extra tests. That means I should be afraid. But actually, it's quite helpful. It's something that can be useful to me, that can help me make a plan for my life and to take care of myself in a different kind of way to build better habits and ultimately to be aware of the sort of uh, health uh, pitfalls that might befall me. And so, likewise, anyone with a human heart <laughs> in the room, metaphorically speaking, is prone to greed and selfishness and apathy. Our family history as humans is full of greed and selfishness and apathy, goat-like behavior. This passage then could scare us when we hear it. It could instead, however, I think, be thought of as some sort of diagnostic test. What have we done lately for those in need? What haven't we done for those in need? Both questions should matter a good bit to those of us who have claimed to invite Jesus into our hearts. The passage asks us to consider whether or not we will or have been or will remain close to Jesus. Speaking of that idea of being close to Jesus, I want to linger on that for a minute. When I was a child, I would visit my grandfather, a tent revivalist, Pentecostal-esque preacher in South Carolina. And he would often say to me, encourage me to invite Jesus into my heart. And I both knew and I didn't know exactly what he meant. I knew that he wanted me to encounter Jesus as he had in some sort of unquestionable and meaningful and transformative way. But I didn't know exactly how the mechanics of that would work, like if Jesus would move into my heart and stay for good, or if he could go away if he found someplace better. Still, I knew that my grandfather wanted me to live my life both present and eternal close to Jesus. Later, as a teen, I attended a non-denominational uh, church, a large one, with at least two coffee shops, smiling people, very sleek furniture, and the kind of budget and priorities that seem to both expect and require a food truck festival and a paintball tournament for every fall kickoff event. <laughs> this church full of lovely people who love Jesus sometimes didn't get it quite right. Sound familiar? One time I overheard an adult volunteer talking to another adult volunteer about uh, a, a person they were concerned about in the youth group, a high school student. And I was, at the time, not yet old enough to think that pretending to be a secret agent and listening in was unusual. Um, and I was old enough to know that eavesdropping is generally frowned upon. But still, I listened in to this conversation. <laughs> The adults were talking about uh, one of the high schoolers who they said had been moving away from Jesus, drifting away. They were not close to Jesus. They were moving away. As I heard them go on, I remembered some of their critiques. They, they said that you know, he had a wardrobe change. He was dressing differently. He had a tattoo now. He said things to the youth praise band director like, you know there's music besides Christian music, right? They didn't like that. They wanted him to be a good Christian, whatever that meant for them. They really did want him to be close to Jesus, and they didn't want him to move away, and they thought that he could. But they forgot that in our passage for today, even the goats and the sheep did not know they were goats or sheep until Jesus told them. Somehow they knew, <laughs> but uh, we don't always know. Finally, as a, a, a caregiver in several senses, pastoral care or care for sick family members in my life or care for three little children, 
I have heard people question why Jesus once felt so close and now Jesus felt far away. Where did he go? I have prayed for the hurting and the sick and those in my care and I have said, Jesus, please draw close to them. Or, God, may they walk with you all of their days. And I both know and I didn't know and I don't know what I mean when I say these prayers. I know that I mean that I want them to feel loved and comforted and cared for in ways that surpass human understanding. I don't know if I mean that we can move closer to or further away from Jesus and vice versa, but I certainly desire that we could all increase our awareness of God's presence with us all the time. And this is where I think that being a Christian, a thinking, faithful Christian, requires us to practice the skill of of dialectical thinking or holding two things in tension, right? Two seemingly competing or contradictory ideas, almost in a paradox together. This knowing and not quite knowing, this experiencing and preparing, this kingdom of Christ that is both now and not yet. And so I believe that we have to cultivate the ability to navigate these tensions, to be able to hold them together to help us with interpreting scripture in in our lived experiences. And so we can return again to the passage for some interpretive possibilities that might require us to understand how Christ the King puts some at his right hand and some at his left, and what does that mean? Well, In our passage for today, again, we get this picture of Jesus the King, which, you know, that might not be super familiar to us, those of us who have not experienced monarchy, and certainly we have not experienced ancient monarchy. And so to see Christ the King, in my view, is to trust that Jesus has the final word on our lives, and to see ourselves in relation to that King, the powerful one. What a powerful name it is, we sang. And so that means above all of the identities we hold, and we hold a lot, right, in relation to other people, a parent, a child, a sibling, a friend, that above all of the things that we hold, that a follower of Christ would be number one above it all. That's what we acknowledge in Christ the King Sunday, that who Jesus is, in large part, ought to lead us to leading our lives and being who we are in a particular way. So, in Matthew 25, we read that all the nations are gathered together before the Son of Man. And that's when he separates them. And some end up in eternal punishment, and others end up in eternal life. And what scholars and interpreters try to do here is to isolate some phrases and see if that can help us better understand. And so one way to view this idea of all the nations, according to Christian ethicist Mark Douglas, is to see all the nations as we might initially see it, of everyone, at every place, across all time. That's who all the nations are. Another way to view this phrase, all the nations, is as it appears in other places in Matthew's gospel, specifically referring to folks at that time who were non-Gentile Christians, or non-Christian Gentiles, Gentiles who were not Christian. And so the early Christians would hear this and they'd be encountering those non-Christian Gentiles wanting to share the gospel in potentially unfriendly environments. And these Christians had initially pledged to enter into a life in which hunger and poverty and imprisonment were likely. And so it could be a sort of dissonant comfort that those who were not kind to them when they were in prison, who had not been helpful to them, might end up in some sort of eternal punishment. Still, For many uh, interpreters, neither of these interpretations fully encapsulate the message here. Both of them have merit. And so by and large, their conclusion is that to understand this passage, we can't only take it in isolation, which admittedly is difficult in like the preaching moment where we're taking passages in isolation, trying to understand them. But we know that preaching and our study of scripture is something that is to happen over the course of our lives, to encounter the Bible in all of its fullness. And so if we do, the conclusion might be that the nature of judgment and whatever implications we perceive, this passage having on our salvation, is worthy of pause and contextualization with the entirety of scripture. And here, when we read this passage, Matthew is so confident and matter of fact. 
And uh, there's an Episcopal priest who I often love named Barbara Brown Taylor, who says that when we uh, read this passage in isolation, we're tempted to treat the Bible as answer book. You know, if you've ever taken a math class with a textbook, and the answer is in the back. Okay, what is this passage? What does this mean? And that's the way it is. But I think this passage does something a little different than that. I think it is meant to be a diagnostic tool. It's meant to challenge us. And perhaps even paradoxically, it's meant to comfort us. So this passage certainly challenges and comforts me. Let's start with the challenging. I'm challenged by the idea that whatever we have done for someone in need, we have done for Jesus. I'm challenged by that because if I'm not careful, I can turn my enactment of my Christian faith into some sort of scorekeeping competition. I like to win. Is anyone hungry? I'm glad to feed you. I will pack an extra lunch. I, I wasn't drinking that anyway. Are you thirsty? You should have this because Jesus is watching and I will not be a goat. I didn't do well in high school with my one and only one lunch detention. I'll tell you that story later. Um, but it made me know that I am not a good candidate for eternal punishment. <laughs> and this passage also challenges me because there have been times when I have helped someone and I wonder if it was the right decision. Um, at one point, I was taking the train a good bit. I was in grad school and visiting my uh, fiance at the time. We we're going back and forth. And I often encounter people who ask for money at the train station. And I you know, thought of this passage. I want to be someone who helps somebody. That's what we're called to do, isn't it? And so at one point, this man comes up to me, and he says, I missed, my I missed my train. I just need a dollar or two. Would you mind just, you know, a dollar or two, and then I'll be on my way? Well, then I missed my train, <laughs> but I did give him a dollar or two, and he comes back to the same place, encounters me, the same person, and asks me the same exact thing. You know, I just missed my train. I need a dollar or two. And I said, well, don't you remember? We just talked. Like, we just had this conversation. And I started to wonder. This man who I know must have been hurting in some way, right? Who, in result, was then engaging in some form of manipulation. Was this Jesus in disguise manipulating me and testing me and wondering if I would be uh, willing, you know, to, to encounter my neighbor as Jesus in front of me? So I'm challenged by what I have done for Jesus or for my neighbor. But I'm also challenged by the things that I have not done. I have not done a lot. What about the time we, I, I avert my eyes at someone on the side of the road who's begging for money? Or what about all of the people all around the world that because of technology, I have increasing awareness, more than we've ever had, of all of the pain all around us all the time? I'm not sure how to keep track of all my inaction there, while also maintaining some sort of reasonable sense of self and obligation to the people in front of me, those committed in my care. Is this some kind of only you can prevent forest fires sort of situation, Smokey the Bear? Because that was a lot of pressure then, and I think it's a lot of pressure now for individuals and for nations. This would be a lot to put the weight of the world on one person or one nation. And again, worst of all, the goats are not condemned because they did bad things, right? They're condemned because they didn't do some good things. And that makes me say, yikes. It challenges me. But on the other hand, <laughs> this passage is of great comfort to me. And I was reading uh, another pastor this weekend who I think described some of these ideas in a way that was really helpful. One of those ideas was that the God of Jesus, the God of the Bible that we read of in this passage and, and throughout scripture, is not some sort of remote being up there on a throne above the clouds or some sort of mis totally mysterious beyond our reach. Jesus says in this passage that God is here in the midst of our messy and ambiguous human lives. God is here, particularly in your neighbor, the one who needs you. You want to see the face of God? You don't feel close to God? Well, look at the least of these, the vulnerable, the weak, the children, and secondly, you know, it's comforting because I think religious leaders often condemn others. Uh, they try to separate, right, the sheep and the goats. 
And they invest a large amount of time in who's in and who's out, who's right and who's wrong. And of course, religious circles are not the only ones that are prone to this. We do this in many other aspects of our life. We have a whole laundry list of issues about which Jesus generally has not a lot to say. There is nothing about judgment in terms of our ecclesial connections, which denomination we were, which practices we did or maybe didn't do, except there is one criteria that Jesus uses, and it's that you saw or didn't see Jesus Christ in the face of the needy, and whether or not you gave yourself away in love in his name. Third, what I find comforting about this passage is it's not that our faith is just social or not just political or economic or religious. It's also personal. God wants not only a new world modeled after Jesus and Jesus' life and death and resurrection, God wants to save us by touching our hearts with love. God wants to persuade us to care and see the other human beings around us as made in the image of God. This is God's favorite project, to teach us the fundamental lesson, the truth that to love is to live. To live is to love eternally. And so if we anticipate the return of Christ, the parables that lead up to this one and this passage itself invites us to be prepared in some sense, but not necessarily to be afraid. As we understand Christ as king, we might reorder and realign our lives to the things that matter, to Christ's teachings, and let go of the things that don't. We take on the character of the kingdom to which we belong, one marked by love, perfect love, scripture tells us, which casts out fear. I don't think fear is the greatest motivator of our faith. So if while we are prepared, waiting for Christ's kingdom to continue breaking forth in our lives or in the life to come, should we run around plagued by fear or even anger at those who are getting it wrong? This passage, I think, suggests no. Those who had met Jesus and their neighbors and those who didn't had no idea that they had met Jesus. It's comforting to me in times when folks might experience a lack of closeness or wonder if God is close to them. This is snapping us into clarity. Simply care for others or don't. This is what Jesus is asking us to consider. And so on the days I'm not sure, if I'm anguishing over, is this next step the right step? Or am I, uh, is my loved one doing the right thing? Or have I done enough for my loved one? We can be comforted that the criteria used is for us at the end of the day is to think about how we're treating our neighbors in whom we can see the divine. I might feel stuck or not sure how to find Jesus in a beautiful, terrible, messy, wonderful life that we have individually and together. And in those times, what I can focus on are the eyes of those in front of me, the eyes of those in need, knowing that we can never be that far from Jesus. We can feed the hungry, we can give drink to the thirsty, we can welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, and visit the imprisoned. We must recognize the sacredness of each individual. Because being close to God, as much as our rituals and routines and sense of being right might help us, being close to God is about living a life of love and action, a life that recognizes the divine in the faces of our neighbors, especially those whose society might often overlook. And so may our lives be representative of this kind of love. May they be marked by seeing the divine in the faces of those we encounter daily, those made in the image of God. Recognizing that when we love one another, we are loving Christ, our King. May the Jesus we invite into our eyes be seen in the eyes of our neighbors, for those eyes are windows to the divine at work. Oftentimes, if you've been online ever, or you've talked to people for an extended period of time, <laughs> you may experience that it's so easy for us to be judge and jury of anyone in our line of vision. 
and we're checking our mirrors to make sure that we are looking like sheep and less like goats. But the sheep and goats didn't know who was who until the very end. We were not meant to be the judges, the evaluators, or the critics. That's not our role. Our role is to love regardless. Whatever energy or urgency we experience when we receive this passage, may it be to love our neighbors, because we can trust that God will sort out the rest. In the meantime, we can be one flock, trusting fully in the good shepherd, Emmanuel, God with us, Christ our King. Amen. Hey, I'm Evan Duncan, the senior pastor of the Baptist Church of Westchester, and I'm so glad you found us on YouTube. I just want to thank you for engaging with us. If, if there is more you want to know about our church, about ways to connect, or, or even if you want to support the work of God in our community, you can visit bcwc.org. That's also how you can connect with us. As you go, I want to share with you a blessing, a benediction that comes out of this book, A Common Prayer, A Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you in the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace and be the church.